was coming by and he said, oh, I forgot to finish my story. <clears throat> I said, yeah, I know how that feels many times. Uh, he said the end of the story after they gave to the neighbor that they received a check in the mail for $800. <laughs> so the, end, the story wasn't just about, you know, the tree falling on your neighbor, but uh, the end result was that when you give, then God has a way of bringing it back to you. Because if he can, Lord can get it to you, he can get it through, or if he can get it through you, he can get it to you. And so many times because he can't get something through us, it doesn't come to us. And so this is a really opportunity for that to happen. So we're just thankful for the generosity of the people here. I mean, obviously you're giving to Love Indeed for the 31 years that you have, and, and it's just it's been amazing. And sometimes we give to people that <clears throat> don't respond back to us in any way, and they don't respond to us. You know, we never get feedback from that point at all. So we're so happy to be uh, to be uh, generous hearts to extend out from that from that day on. So anyway, so again, the Matthew family, if you want to do something, I'll give you time to do it. You at the end, just put it in the box. You'll see the two boxes in the in the back there to be able to do that. Turn with me if you would. <coughs> Excuse me this morning. I'm still getting over laryngitis. I left to go to the Arctic uh, with laryngitis. I thought it's not good to be going to the far north with laryngitis and then did a memorial uh, on Friday, Thursday for Bill, Bill Brown's wife, Gerda. And I was just squeaking out and then had five services ahead of that. And so I just said, Lord, help me know what to do. So I was out buying a shirt, which I bought this shirt <clears throat> in Edmonton. I came to demonstrate it for you. <laughs> and I was in this in the mall and uh, this guy said, man, your voice sounds pretty, pretty raspy. And I said, yeah, I know. And he said, um, I know you won't look, you won't understand this, but I am a trained opera singer. And I thought, you're right, I don't understand that. <laughs> he said, I'm just paying the bills between tours, but I am a touring opera singer. And as an opera singer, I can tell you what we do for our voice. And I said, please tell me. He said, we take Slippery Elm. I said, Slippery Elm? I thought he was joking with me. <clears throat> it's like Eye of Newt or, you know, Swamp Water or whatever. I didn't know what he was talking about. So he pulled it up, and sure enough, there was some Slippery Elm. Never heard of it. And uh, capsules, and, and so I took Slippery Elm, and 30 minutes later, I was able to at least get through and uh, do the memorial service. So if you're ever in that condition, remember Slippery Elm. Slippery Elm. <laughs> or, you know... I kept going to say, you know, it's like slippery bark or something like that. But anyway, and there's nothing more miserable with it. When you need to speak, you can. So I'm happy to be home, happy to be back. Where it's colder, I think, here than where I was. I posted out there was a minus seven, but I, 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 <clears throat> I forgot to put on there that that was Celsius. And so that makes it about 25 degrees. So wasn't as bad, all that bad anyway. I do want to continue on this morning with uh, when I was here last with you, talking about the pressure of his presence. And normally when we talk about uh, his presence of the Lord, we think like for Psalm 16, where it says, in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures of evermore. But is it possible that the presence of God has other, other uh, manifestations other than the fact of us just having joy? Could it be the fact that there's times that the Lord starts putting pressure on us because he's a good father <clears throat> and he knows that he can bring out the best in us by certain ways that he knows how to apply the right pressure. You find out in, in Hebrews where he talks about that a, a good father, he loves us so much that he disciplines. And the word discipline means we kind of think the idea that God's upset with us and he's, he's spanking us. But discipline is for, for the purpose of bringing out the best in us, to discipling, to training us, because he sees the end from the beginning. You find out in Jonah, the first chapter, and we don't read too much from Jonah. I'm sure that you're, you're, you've got Jonah marked there in your Bible where you read it every day. And <clears throat> but I do want to extract a couple of things out of that. Just a second. I'm fine. There I go. 
Anybody have any slippery on one right now? I mean, I had people giving me honey tainted with whatever it was, and I was putting down all the stuff and all that. So, Okay. In Jonah, it's an interesting story, and there's some things I'd like to highlight. And it starts out that God speaks to Jonah, and he says, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to send you to Nineveh. And uh, the Ninevites were rebellious. They were totally against things of God. They, they were idolatrous. They even worshiped fish gods. So, you know, when, when God used uh, this fish to spit Jonah out on the, on the shore, that, oh, they, how shocked they were because they saw this fish they believed was a god. All of a sudden, they're willing to hear the, what he spit out. So a couple of things I want to extract out of that. Number one in verse three. But Jonah rose to flee from Tarshish. He had a, a mandate from God. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid to the fare there and went down to it and go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. About four or five times, he uses the term, the presence of the Lord. That there's an omnipresence of God that we cannot get away from because he is everywhere in creation. But it's also possible that though you can't get away from the omnipresence of God, you can leave the manifest presence of God. That that's a choice that we make to get closer to him. So the omnipresence of God was with him, but Jonah was running from the manifest presence of God. So he's going in the opposite direction, maybe even had a peace that it was really this was God because he found someone or a ship going in the direction that he wanted to go. It's easy to come to the point of saying this must be God. It confirms because I'm going in the direction I want to go, though it is the opposite direction where God wants him to be. So you cannot just say, well, I feel a peace about it. There's a peace that is external and then there's a peace that's internal. When the Bible talks about in Colossians, the peace of God rules and reigns. That's an internal uh, constraint upon us that say, I may not like the situation, but I have a peace about it because I know God's in it. I don't like the conditions and circumstances I'm in, but I know somehow or another God's in the middle of this. When I came to Tyler, I've told you this many times, I didn't want to come. This was back in 1980, but I had a peace about it. There was a conflict. My soul didn't want to come because it was strange, not that you were strange people, but it was an environment that I'd never been in and leaving from what was familiar to going to what was unfamiliar, but I had a peace internally. Everything externally was shouting at me and saying that this isn't right. If it was right, you'd feel better about it and all of the circumstances. So we can't always say, I have a peace about doing something that's in the opposition to God. So when God has a way of getting us where we need to be at all costs at times, so look in verse 4. He went down, he's heading out to Tarshish, he's running from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4, but the Lord sent out a great wind. Now notice, it wasn't the devil, it was the Lord who sent out the great wind. I mean, when God blows on something, it becomes a wind. He sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Notice it's God. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God. In other words, just, they were all idolatrous cried out to his God, hoping someone would hear him. They threw the cargo that was in the ship out to lighten the load, but Jonah had gone down in the lowest parts of the ship and laid down, and he was fast asleep. You can convince yourself something is okay and even be at peace and convince yourself mentally and rest in it all the while God's saying, I didn't, I'm not sending you that direction. So there again, the peace of God is something that is internally inside stirring us to be moving in the same direction that God wants us to go. All right. Verse 6, the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? In other words, we're all up here sweating, throwing stuff over, and you're down here sleeping. What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Our gods hadn't worked, obviously. And they said to one another, <clears throat> come let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. God has a way of putting his finger on you. Then they said to him, please tell us, for what cause is this tribulation or trouble, troubling that's upon us? What is your occupation? That's a good one. What do you do for a living? I just ride from ship to ship. I'm just kind of a cruiser. What is your occupation, and what's going on? In other words, what are you going to hear? And they said to them, where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. And he, well, there you go. 
And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. In other words, all you're seeing right here, God made this. Verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that, they, that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Now he's even admitting it. Even the point is, I'm proud about it. I'm standing up against God. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me over. I thought, just by faith, won't you just jump out yourself? Pick me up, throw me over, and, uh, and the sea will be calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Look at verse 14. They cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with his innocent blood for you, O Lord God, have, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, threw him in the sea, and the sea ceased from its anger. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. In other words, we, let's switch gods. We found the real God right here. The God that throws men overboard, he's let him be gone. Verse 17. The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Look at all the while that God says he prepared a storm, he prepared a fish, and all the things that God prepared because he loved Jonah. Not to teach Jonah a lesson, not to be you know, angry at him and say, I'm just going to show you how bad I can be, but to show Jonah that I want you to fear me, but I want you also to be obedient to me as well. When you follow us down through this whole concept in, in chapter 2, pick it up in verse 4. The fish swallows him up, and he begins to have, raise out this, this cry out to the Lord. For you have cast me in the deep in the heart of the seas, and the floods surround me, and all your billows and your waves have passed over me. It's amazing how poetic he became when he's in the fish. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, or from your presence, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. In other words, when you find yourself not in the presence of God, begin to look for the word temple there means where you're presenced, where you begin to find yourself habitating. I will look again to your holy temple. Thy waters surround me, even the soul. The deep closed around me. The weeds were wrapped around my head. Can you get the picture? What in the belly of this fish? It doesn't say it's a well, the belly of this fish. Seaweed and every kind of scavenged things wrapped around him. He's living in this, in this, this nasty environment. The deep closed around me, the weeds wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. I mean, he is right. He was the first submariner. I thought that was pretty good. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever, yet you have been brought up by my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Now look at verse 7. When my soul fainted, look at the turn that began to happen. He was running from the presence of God, but God was still not removing his omnipresence. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to, to you and into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, in other words, are you ready to hear now? You go into the, into the city. Now look in chapter 3, verse 4, just to finalize with this part. Verse 3. Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three-day journey in extent. Look at verse 4. And Jonah began to enter the city on the next day. Did you get it? It's a three-day walk, but he gets there in one day. Then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It's interesting, once a person decides that I'm going to do it God's way, I'm going to give myself to the obedience of the Lord, even if it's something that I don't really want to do, because Jonah was very prejudiced against the Ninevites. And so once he yielded himself to the obedience of God, God cut a three-day trip down into one day. He knows how to get us there quicker once we're willing to yield and give himself to the, to the obedience of the Lord. So in this process, we find that God's presence was so dear and wanting to be on Jonah and Jonah leaving the presence of God, God still pursued him. Could it be that even in the midst of all the problems and the chaos that Jonah was facing, was it still part of the presence of God? 
If that was still part of the presence of God, then I have to say that not just when I feel joy am I in the presence of God, but I can also be in the presence of God when something is happening to get my attention. <clears throat> So just because my life is then maybe in chaos and things happening around me that looks like, boy, you're in rebellion to God or something going on, the presence of the Lord can cause, even in the midst of chaos, to still presence us. When he was in the belly of this fish, he does a couple of things. He turns his heart back towards God and he begins to cry out to God and he begins to give thanksgiving to God and honor the Lord in the middle of chaos. I find that when we do one or two things, when when uh, we're in the midst of a problem that we can't solve on our own. Number one is we tend to either run towards God or we run from God. We either get angry towards God and saying, look what you've done to me. We blame God, and I want to get away. I want to get away from everybody that is serving God. I want to get away from anybody that says, hallelujah, praise God. Everybody's religious after that. Nobody, nobody is uh, you know, sincere in their belief, and we tend to get more hardened in our heart towards God. One or two things that Jonah could become more hardened and more angry towards God and more blaming towards God and even blaming the Ninevites for putting the situation or... Your heart turns towards the Lord and say, I remember the presence of God. I remember when I was <clears throat> the presence of God brought me into more fulfillment. So this chaos is not the absence of the presence of God. It's just a different side of the presence of God. It's a different side that will con continually put pressure up on us to bring us to the ultimate, which God prefers that, I, that we delight ourselves in him. We enjoy who he is. We worship him you know, without pressure, but still because of who he is, and we made a commitment to him at some point in line, time, he said, I'm going to put pressure on you. I've told you before, I remember being on a long trip and ministering for about 10 days, just solidly, every day, every day. I, I got on the plane, I was exhausted. And uh, the people where I was, they, they were just, every day, you go here, we need to go over here. We got to go meet with this person, we need to meet with this person. And you continually, not any time of rest, came back on the plane, and I said, God, I just feel like those people are using me. You know, they're just using me. And the enemy would just say, yeah, they're just using you. Right in the middle of that, I heard the Lord say, I remember the day when you said, use me, Lord. So the fact is, if we're being used, it's because the fact we've made somewhere down the line, we've made an a vow, inner vow towards God, I want you to use me. And God takes those vows so seriously so that when we move in the opposite direction of him being used, using us, he pursues us based on that vow. Now notice Jonah comes back and they start saying that we made our vows to the Lord. There is an internal witness inside of us saying, I'm never going to allow myself to get in that kind of mess again. I'm never going to run from the presence of God again. I'm never going to complain when God uses me. I'm never going to complain when I'm in, in problem, problematic situations because he delivers me out of them all. So they begin to make vows to the Lord. They were not useless vows, but they're vows. And God says, I connect with those words, and I'm going to keep pursuing you because of my presence in you. Now look with, there's a corresponding verse in Proverbs, excuse me, Psalms, <clears throat> Psalms 27. In fact, even Jonah refers to this. I could spend the whole morning just on this one psalm. But look, pick it up in, in uh, Psalms 27. Verse 4, this is David's crying out in desperation. David understood how to call upon the Lord when his enemies were surrounding him, and he makes this statement, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. In other words, there's three things particularly. When you feel like things are enclosed around you, begin to narrow your focus. Say, one thing I've desired. Well, I've got all these issues going on in life. I've got health problems going on in life. My family's falling apart. I've got financial issues. All of these things are coming around me. David began to narrow it down, not talking about how big his enemies are, how bad it are. He narrowed it down to one thing. This thing, I, one thing I know. This one thing, and I've desired that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He wasn't talking about moving into church. The house of the Lord is I'm going to dwell in this position of the habitation of the Lord continually, not just when problems arise, but I want to continually be in this state of worship, this lifestyle of worship, and I want to keep my focus so narrowed 
And we have to, we're in a political age that's polarized. And I want to encourage every one of you that are politically active and you watch the news continually and you get, you get stirred up and ah, how can they do that? And all Whatever your political persuasion is, narrow it down and say one thing I've desired. I can pray about a lot of things, but one thing I've desired, the word desire means an insatiable appetite that keeps me wanting this more than any other thing in my life. One thing I've desired, if Jesus is not the one thing, then our focus has become so, so convoluted to where that, well, we're, now we're after this thing, and now we're after that thing, and everything can stir us up. But when you become a one thing person, where it is eternal that when all of this is said and done and all this temporary stuff falls apart I know where my faith is and I know whom I have believed that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day the one thing causes you to be anointed the one thing allows you not to be concerned about what else everybody else has done the injustices or got snubbed or this happened or that happened and what about that what do they think the one thing is I know without a doubt who my redeemer and he lives so when you become one focus in that point, somehow or another, all of the enemies begin to shrink towards to be submitted to the one thing. David went on to say, of the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord, not the injustice of the world, the beauty of the Lord. What is the beauty of the Lord? His glory is one of those things. His glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. It's one day, he said it, one day that the earth is going to be so covered with the glory of the Lord. The presence of God is this awareness that he's with me. It's that internal awareness. But the glory of God is something that becomes so more tangible that we see that it causes things to start happening in a way that I know favor. And we call it the anointing. Things divinely inspired by God begins to happen. That's out of the ordinary. His presence is always with us as we're worshiping. We love him. We wake up every morning with a sense of he is with me. But when his glory begins to set upon us, there's an awareness that is so weighty that you don't want to do anything but just stand in that place. It's that point of him coming and visiting you, and you don't want to jump up and so go make coffee and tea for the neighbors. You just want to stand in that place and say, I just want to soak up and saturate because the beauty of the glory, the beauty of his holiness, beauty of his temple. To inquire in his temple, in other words, go after his presence. In the midst of his presence, there is a sense that you can begin to pray and believe God for things supernatural. You can begin to ask the Lord for things that are out of this world because now there's a being led by the Holy Spirit as this is the thing. You can begin to pray like you've never prayed before. You have this confidence the very thing that you're asking will be answered. Okay, I haven't got to the kicker yet. Hang on. He shall hide me in his pavilion, his covering, his, over, his overshadowing. Go into Psalms 91. I will abide under the shadow. The word shadow, there's teslem. It was the thoughts of the Lord. I'm going to live under the thoughts of the Lord. Just to live around life where God's continually saying, hey, what are you about this? Think about this. You ever thought about this? And the enemy says, tries to inject another thought <clears throat> or offensiveness or hurt or fear, whatever it might be. And you just want to abide under the thoughts of, that's not God, this is the Lord. The peace of God rules. I'm going to dwell in, the, in his pavilion. I'm going to be covered up with his thoughts. He shall hide me, he shall set me upon a rock. Remember that Exodus 33? He said, Moses said, I want to see your glory. And he said, I'm going to hide you in the rock. When he places you into the rock, pressure, push you into the rock, which is a relationship with Jesus, then you can see the glory. Now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies. In other words, I'm no longer cowed, no longer intimidated. Therefore, because I recognize how God is greater than that, therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in the tabernacle, in his presence. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, my cry when I, with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to your face, I will seek. The word face there, pane, which means presence. So he tells us, David recognized, seek the presence of God. What does that fully mean? It means I want to make sure that all the other cares of life do not implode or impede upon me having an awareness of the goodness of the God of my life. 
<clears throat> I don't want it to be such a way that I'm focused upon the problems and focused on what I don't have and focused upon how bad things are, but I want to have this awareness of who he is. That's what it means to seek the face of God. When you feel like you're under pressure, you feel like you're overwhelmed, stop and go back to the one thing I know is, and that I just want to have this awareness that he's with me. Back in 2000, and I felt like three, from all around me, 360 degrees was imploding on me. The enemy was coming in so many different directions. I couldn't do anything right. And I would tell God, I can't do anything right. And I remember the Lord stopped me and said, but I can. He said, quit trying to be right and be righteous. So I laid all that down and I thought, Lord, if nothing else works out and I end up not doing what I'm doing now and I'm just doing something else, I'm happy to do that, find a job doing something else where I can do something right. And the Lord had just said to me, your identity is not what you do, your identity is who you are. When you let go of trying to be something and you just simply said, I am being him, Christ in you. Him, the being. It releases you from all of the external pressures that try to, to implode on you. And you realize that the Bible says in 1 John 4, greater is he, greater is he, the anointed one inside of you, than the he that's on the outside, the God of this world that's trying to put pressure and put pressure on you to implode. Let me, let me hear me this morning. When the enemy tries to compare you with someone else or tries to put pressure on you based on someone else, that means the fact is that I'm allowing the world's pressure to be greater than the impression, impressing of the Holy Spirit. If I never preach another message, I love him and he loves me and I, that's enough. If I don't do anything else that I feel like I'm called to do, the idea that greater is he that's in me than anything else I could be outside to be called to do. <clears throat> When that begins to happen, it frees you from the pressures of the world and the cares of life, and now you're free to allow the Holy Spirit to flow out. Because you're, you're not there to impress. You're there to love him. We were in the Arctic, and I told the Lord, man, I'm, my voice is gone. I don't feel really great. And I heard the Lord said, well, when you're weak, I'm strong. Stand forth, see the salvation of the Lord today. I was so tired and so without any energy at all because I didn't have to speak. I shared a simple message. And at the end of that, people had never done this before. They never got that response. started coming up. And the power of the Holy Spirit started coming up on people and breaking. The people that had been so angry at one another for years and years that I knew it had said in counseling with them, they had, had offended with one another so strongly that different people had had affairs within the church and they're still in there. And all this was going on, and that day, the Holy Spirit, when I couldn't do anything, he broke through that, and they were beginning to repent to one another, love on one another, and the sovereignty and the presence of God took over. And that's when he began to tell me, you're putting way too much pressure on yourself, and you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to impress you. <clears throat> Greater is he that's in you. Out of you shall flow, not from you. Out of you. Yes. Now, look at the rest part of it. Verse 13, you still with me? Verse 13, teach me, teach me that I've lost my way, teach my heart, I would have lost heart, verse 13 rather, I would have lost heart unless and believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. <clears throat> you know what he says, when I lose the ability to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, then I lose heart. The word lose heart there literally means to have like someone just kick, kick the, knock the air out of your gut. It means I don't have strength. I'm fainting. I'm, I'm getting ready to pass out. I don't have any strength to fight it at all. <clears throat> and I find many times that the, that the enemy says, go ahead and give yourself permission to be weak. I'm weak. This is just who I am. Life's dealt this way with me. This is it. So I start telling myself, you're weak. It's okay to check out of life. It's okay to be out. And everybody else has their problem and all that. And when you start giving yourself permission, as one thinks of his heart, so they become like. That's right. That's right. 
Nobody knows the sorrow I have. Nobody knows but Jesus. Ah, yeah, he knows. He said, just don't stay there. I know your heart. David said, and here's a warrior, I would have literally fallen over and fainted, passed out, if I could not have believed, have hope, to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In the midst of all the problems, I'm seeing one day that I'm going to be in the goodness of the Lord. Now, if you go back into, into Exodus 33, when God says, I'm going to let my, you're going to see my glory, I'm going to let my goodness, which is the name for his glory, I'm going to let my goodness pass over you. So what David was saying, I would have fainted. I would have lost hope. And where there's no hope, the soul has nothing to anchor us to. I just came from a place where suicide is, on a, is a weekly thing going on, where alcoholism is rampant at a high level. So I shared the church. I said, unless the church starts governing in the spirit realm over the entire city, you're going to lose more of your young people than you have had before. <clears throat> They begin to lose hope. There's nothing to live for. Everything before them, the external outward looking things, prosperity, their life and their future just falls apart until you get to the point of saying, I have got to have hope in my heart that I can see the goodness of the Lord or the glory of the Lord is coming. I may not feel it right now, but I know it's coming. And hope is the anchor of the soul. So it tells me that without hope, we take away a person's the ability to have, see any future and to even believe prophetically for their future. One of the things the enemy starts with is to remove hope. And he does so by reminding you of how good it used to be. Oh, it used to be so good. Now look at you. To remove all hope instead of pointing it to, it may have been good, but he, God is a God of glory to glory. He's a God of abundance. He's a God that moves us into greater things. No matter how good it was, and Paul said, I have to forget those things that are behind me. He didn't say, I just need to forget the bad things. I need to even forget the good things that tries to cause my life to relive something of the past because he's moving me into a greater level of glory, a greater level of who he is. So when David is saying, <clears throat> I would have no longer wanted to go out to battle, I would have no longer wanted to confront the enemy had I not been able to see the goodness of the Lord is still there in the land of the living. Now there's three, three elements that are connected with this. Number one is hope to be able to see. Proverbs 20, 19, so where there is no vision, people perish. When they haven't lost the ability to see, it doesn't mean die, perish. It means they have no longer anchored themselves. And if hope is the anchor of the soul, it means I no longer have hope. I'm going through the motions. I feel dead in the marriage. I feel dead in the job. I feel dead in life. I feel dead at everything I do. It's because there's hope has been caused to be deferred. Yes, right. And hope deferred makes the heart sick. So David was saying, instead of blaming everybody else around me for making me feel the way I do, he said, narrow your focus down. Let it be one thing I've desired. I'm going to center my heart and my affection upon the Lord, not on what somebody has or has not done, because blame is so easy to give and so easy to receive. And he said, I'm going to set my gaze upon the Lord. And in doing so, I restored my ability to see. And the next part of that, the ability to hope to see and the goodness of the Lord and the glory of God. And that glory is a sense of canopy of covering us in all that we do. Okay, and then he goes on to say <clears throat> that I'm going to, in verse, in verse 6, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies. How are we going to do that? Trash talk? You know, you're nothing more than that. You devil, you're a liar. Get out of my face. You know what he did? I will offer sacrifices of joy. Joy is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. Well, I don't feel like it. Well, you don't have to feel like it. Just do it. Happiness is a feeling. Joy is a spirit. The joy of the Lord is part of the anointing. When you're anointed, there's joy. You don't even have to enjoy what you're doing, but joy, the word rejoice means to rejoin him in how he thinks and who he is. When you rejoice, it's not because, oh, I had a good thought and, you know, I'm going to get a raise or I got the day off next week. I'm, I can joy. But rejoice means I've, I found myself partnering with him. I've joined with him, and we're rejoining. We're rejoicing because God's not sitting in the heavens saying, man, what are we going to do with this mess on the earth? 
When we rejoice with him, we begin to see it from his vantage point, and we begin to think like he thinks because now we've changed our thought pattern and begin having the thoughts of the Lord. Now, Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 4, which is really key in, in developing a new mind strategy. When I say mind strategy, I mean literally beginning to change the way that we think. You can be angry at the world, be angry at everybody else around you, which is a permission to check out of life. Or, because let me tell you, it has an effect on you physically. Your body responds to how we think. Thank you for that. Second Corinthians 4. <laughs> Pick it up, verse 16. Therefore, do not lose heart, for me word, do not lose heart, do not lose the ability to seek God's goodness. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. The inward man affects the outward man. The inward man is renewed day by day. He said, no matter how old you are on the calendar, we should be coming refreshing and stronger internally than we even feel externally. Because when you meditate on the Lord, it's not meditating on what God hasn't done for you. You meditate upon the Lord, you simply begin to think of all the goodness that he's done and all of the mercy he's done. He died on the cross for me. If he never has done another thing, that's enough. That's enough yes. If you've ever worried about something, you know how to meditate. <laughs> think about that. You'll catch it in a moment. Well, I... Somebody's got to worry about it, so why not me? No, he's not called anybody to worry about it. He's called to meditate upon the Lord. It means to mediate between, let God mediate. Meditate means I see him bigger than the problem. All right, look at this. Therefore, when we do not lose heart, even though the outward is perishing, the inward man is being renewed, refreshed. The word is resuscitate day by day. There is the wind of the Spirit, breath of God flowing in. For our light affliction means it's not too heavy, but it is, there is there. Our light affliction, that just doesn't mean illness. That means anything that tacks, torments, touches, pokes on you. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. <clears throat> you ought to underline that. Really? It's working for us. Right. It sure doesn't feel good, but it's working for you. Right. It's working in behalf of you. Can you imagine Jonah down in the belly of this fish? And he said, this is working for you, Jonah. You're getting a free cruise back to where you should have been to start with. It's working for you. Oh, Lord, I got the seaweed wrapped around my head. And all of that, the gastric juices have just tripped me. I'm just, you know, just nothing but a, a shell of a man. It's working for you. How's it working for you? It's all working for me. All things work together for good <clears throat> to those that love God. First of all, you have to love God, the prerequisite, and are called according to his purpose. Obviously, Jonah loved God, but he still had this passive rebellion in him. I love you, God, but I only love you when I do something that I don't want to do. He said, I'm going to work in your behalf, Jonah. I'm going to put you in a position that you're going to be more delightful when you land up on the shore of Nineveh. You'll be so glad after you get out of this position that you'll never want to go back into there. I've been in those positions. Our light affliction, just for a moment, is working for us a far, a far exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The word weight there would be in the Hebrew, but it's, it would be weighty. In other words, kavod. In other words, God's pressure. The weightiness is there is the pressing of the glory of God upon you. So I so said, well, God doesn't pressure. Yes, he does. The weightiness of the Lord. The Bible says when the glory of the Lord filled the temple that the priests could not even stand. What does that mean? They, they didn't like one another. I don't stand. I can't stand them. I anyway, say it was so weighty upon them physically they could not stand and they went down to the ground. He said, the, way, the, the afflictions are working in your behalf in such a way, and the glory of the Lord is coming in such a way to strip from us everything that resists who he is so that exceeding amount of glory is going to be so weighty that you'll not be able to stand, but you'll, be, you'll just submit yourself before God. 
So whatever you're going through today, whatever you feel like is in pressure, it's working for you. If you love God and you have his purpose in mind, no matter what's happening, it's working for you. And I know right now some of you think, oh, you don't know what I'm going through. <clears throat> you don't know what I'm going through. You can walk through it without smelling like smoke, without letting everybody else around you know how miserable you are. How you doing? <laughs> wow. I mean, okay, good day to you too. Well, you wanted to ask. But when you walk, when you walk through things in the presence with you and the weightiness of who he is, is I'll take you to the other side and I'll take you through this. But it can be a short, short trip or it can be a long trip. We decide how long. I don't want to go through this again. Diane says this all the time. I want to learn this lesson the first time so I don't go around this mountain again. So if that's, that's you, then here it is. It's a momentary light affliction. What extends something, let me just throw in what extends it, if I complain about it, yeah. talk, blame somebody else for getting me into that, feel that, feel like, you know, if this hadn't happened, you hadn't done this to me and all these things, that means I've extended the cruise. The tour of duty is going to be longer. I'm going to be on walking guard posts until I learn this. Look at verse 18. It's an exceeding weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, which is all I do is see the walls of a fish, but I, th but I look at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. The conditions and the momentary light affliction is, a, is seen, but it's not the eternal. That which is seen are temporary or temporal, but the things which are seen are eternal. Going back to, to Psalms 27, I would have fainted had unless I've been able to see the goodness of the Lord. Looking past the temporary and seeing the hope of the future that he's called me into, that I will not always be in this situation. I'll not always be dealing with this. I'll not always have to be going through this. I'll not always be struggling with this. I'm seeing the goodness of the Lord and his glory is going to help pass me through this. When you go through that, making those declarations and those inner vows inside of you, instead of making an inner vow, I'll never let that person talk to me again. I'm never going to let them get close to me again. I'm never going to let another man. I'm never going to let another one. I'm not going to believe anyone. I'm not going to trust anybody. Those are inner vows that has kept us circling again and again and again. It may have felt like it was protecting ourselves emotionally, but the same inner vow we make on the, same, on the out, on, in the inside that keeps people away is the same inner vow that pushes God back. Because God loves people. Here it is. For while we do not look at the things we're seeing, but the eternal, but the things which are not seen are eternal, he's saying this one thing I know. Set your affection, set your eyes on a, on a very focused gaze, and that is the eternity of the living God. There have been times when I couldn't find anything tangible that I could touch and say, that was working. There's times I've had to step back and say, you know what? I'm just I'm looking for eternity. Because the nasty now and now is so nasty and so terrible. I'm just gonna thank you, Lord, one of these days I'm gonna rejoice in the presence of God forever and ever and ever. And that's gonna be my delight. He'll in times he'll take you through that where he'll allow you to get a glimpse of glory that will help bring you through the momentary light afflictions so you don't get stuck there. Let me finish up with this. Philippians 3, verse 10. Paul gives us this, this understanding of how he thinks, and he's calling us to walk in the same, same place. This is an interval that we all should make. That I may know him. That I may know him. Spend my whole life getting to know him. My whole life recognizing how good he is. My whole life just shunning the ways of the world. And I'm not talking about everything in the world's bad, but there's things that take from him. Time and energy. And there's times people spend all their time trying to find something wrong with someone else or the system 
that they're, they're in their critical criticism of that, they just come to the point they miss the bigger picture. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection, everything that the resurrection brought that now is working inside of us is operating at a higher level and a full, full extent of who you are. So the power of his resurrection means that I'm operating under the same anointing that brought Jesus out of the tomb. Not any less than. The same power and anointing that brought Jesus out of the tomb is still operating to me right now. But it comes through knowing him. And the fellowship of his sufferings, koinonia. I wish I could come up with another word that means fellowship. doesn't mean fellowship, but it means fellowship. It means because we come together and you're knowing me, then you're going to have my heart. What breaks the heart of the Lord breaks your heart. What you enjoy, he enjo what he enjoys, you enjoy. Proverbs 6 says, here's the things that God hates, also things that he likes. So he said, we're going to fellowship. I want, to, I want you to know how I, what my sense of my heart is over things. Look at verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press, that is literally pressure. I am under pressure. For most of us today in our generation, this generation, we don't want anything to put us under pressure. I don't want to be under pressure to go to church. I don't want to be under pressure to say anything. I don't want to be under pressure to do anything. I do not want pressure. <clears throat> and because we don't want pressure, we never learn things. It's out of being under this pressure that I've learned more hands-on than if I had not done it. I don't want to be under pressure to prophesy. Well, you shouldn't be under pressure to prophesy. Well, look, tell me what. Let me tell you. If you've ever done much of it, there is pressure there. I have one guy that's a friend of mine. <clears throat> He's a pastor in Kentucky. And occasionally he'll call me, Carrie. He's got this voice. That's come preaching years without a microphone. Curry, I got someone here. Talk to them, which is code language where they need a word from God. My first response is, man, I'm not going to let you do me that way. You're not going to put me under pressure like that. And as soon as I think that, immediately the Lord says something to me about someone I'm talking on the phone that I don't even know. This guy's apostolic. I, I do trust him when he's doing one of the last few times there, he called me up, and I was vacuuming for Diane, trying to get some points. Because <laughs> I read somewhere that women think men who vacuum are really sexy. Um, I was doing it with a flair. I didn't say it was a Christian study. I just said it was a study. <clears throat> some of you all got a picture now. So I was vacuuming, get this call, Gary, need to talk to this guy. And I thought, oh boy, I am not in the, I'm in a vacuuming mood. I am, I'm in the Diane mood. <laughs> and so as soon as he got on the phone, I thought, oh man, I'm just going to give him a quick prayer and you know, bless you and be on your way. As soon as I heard this guy's voice, I said, God's going to give you the power to deliver an entire nation from corruption. My mind thought, wow, that's crazy. And I said, it's going to be millions of dollars flow through your hands, but the money doesn't belong to you. It belongs for this country. And he's given you the power to stand up against corruption. And the enemy's going to try to tempt you and pull you into the same spirit that's, that's controlling that nation. Went on for that for a couple of minutes. And the guy's, okay, okay, okay. Hands the phone back to this guy, and he said, what would you say? I told him, I said, oh, my God, you don't have any clue. And I said, no, I don't. That's it. A few weeks later, Diana are in Kentucky, and we come into this room and called the green room, which is not green. And he says, there's a guy here that wants to meet you. This guy was as white as, like another width as me. He was this wide, looked like a linebacker. He grabs my hand and just squeezes it till it was just like that. And he said, I've been wanting to meet you. He said, I'm the guy you talked on the phone a few weeks ago. He said, I'm from the Congo. I'm in charge of the lottery system for my country. And the country is right now in, in uh, 
financial turmoil and the president right there is trying to steal the lottery money from the people and take it and, and, and run with it. And so went on that and he started telling me the whole story and he's up now uh, for election soon. They think he'll be elected as the president. Hallelujah. I, after I talked to him, I, I just felt about this high and the Lord said, if you had not yielded to pressure, you would have not been seeing the power. Because power is released through pressure. But most of the time, as believers, the pressure becomes, the first response is, in my mind, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I, how. And we start wrangling in our mind instead of saying, yes, Lord, I will. We'll figure out how later. So when Paul said, I press towards the mark, it doesn't mean the fact is I feel good about it. I enjoy this thing. It is simply is I've made a vow inside of my heart saying I belong to you and I'm willing to allow you. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony. It speaks of who Jesus is and he said allow the Holy Spirit to put pressure on so you can testify of who Jesus is. Look at this. Paul says, verse 12, it's a mouthful. Not that I've already attained to or am already perfected or finished is the word, but I press on, press, allow the pressure, I press on that I may hold on, may hold of that which Christ. The word Christ is very important in this passage. It is the anointed one and his anointing. So if you read it like this, I may lay hold on the anointed and the anointed one, Jesus also who laid hold on me. I'm gonna lay hold on the anointing because the anointed one laid hold on me. So what he's saying is, in order to allow the anointing, the empower of the Holy Spirit, there's times that we have to yield to pressure because he'll put pressure or impress us in such a way that goes beyond our feelings, beyond our ability, beyond our background. But when we yield to that, then he says, the, the anointed one now has hold of you. But if I say, Lord, that's not me, it should be someone else. And he says, you don't want me to grab hold of you? Paul said, I'm pressing towards that. Because I want the anointed one to hold on to me so that his anointing would roll, run through me. Now, let me quickly just give you some of these things. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ or the anointing, old things die. Part of the anointing is not the enablement to do something, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit to cause some things to die. He knows how to kill flesh. He knows how to separate soul and spirit. He knows how to get us to the point that God says the greater usability or the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come to that level when the power and manifestation of God can come freely. If he can't trust you in the few things of yielding to it, how can we say, God, I want this huge, giant, great ministry? I can't even trust you to go over and pray for that person that's limping there in Walmart. How are you going to do this big thing? When I trust you with a few things, then I'll, I'll give you a greater authority. So if any man be in the anointing, then the anointing be in him. All things pass away. Behold, take a look at, see, all things become new. To the level that old things die is to the level that, old, that new things can come. I can't see new things because I'm beholding all the old things. Diane and I have a friend after we talk to him five minutes, they'll give you 25 or 30, even more years of history. So you, you don't know what they've done to me. My parents did this to me. My parents didn't allow me to do this. I couldn't go to school. I couldn't do all this, all these things. And because of grabbing hold of the past, I can't see what God has for me. I don't care how much you prophesy to them. Part of receiving forgiveness and releasing forgiveness is the ability to turn loose some of the path that gets you stuck there and behold all things become new now I'm in the ability to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living I can see it there's the promise that God's called us to the problem with Israel or the Hebrews at that time all they could think about was Egypt in Egypt, we had plenty to eat. Egypt, the, the meat pots were full, and we had plenty of, of spices, and everything was good in Egypt. Oh, yeah, we were slaves, but we had no identity. We couldn't own anything. We had no legacy. We had no future, but we could eat. 
because they could not see themselves coming out of Egypt, when it came time, God says, here's a land that is so prosperous. You got wells that you haven't dug. You got vineyards you haven't planted. Houses you're going to have to build, it's yours. Oh, wow, sounds too good to be true. But I remember in Egypt, at least we knew who we were there. God was bringing them into a new identity that they had never experienced before, so they criticized everything God did because it was new. Part of it, he's saying, if anyone is in the anointing and the anointing is in them, I will sever old things that have no value for your future. I love this part. In Matthew 16, verse 16, Jesus is having a conversation with Peter. I don't know if Peter thought they were just, hey, hanging out and, you know, talking about the weather. But in the middle of that, Jesus says, Peter, who do men, other people, say that I am? Yeah. And he starts out very general and he's saying, oh, well, some people say you're a teacher. Some say that you're you know, you're a rabbi, some say you're this, some say you're that. Jesus turns to Peter and he said, but who do you say that I am? It's not enough for you to tell what other people are saying. You can report other te testimonies, you can teach what other people have taught. But truth that's not bought and it's only borrowed never becomes your truth. You gotta write that down. Because you can quote other you can quote other people what they say, and it's only borrowed truth. Man, that sounded good. That sounds really good. But when you buy it, means that I've bought into it. Now it is it is directing. It is has a, a hook in my life, and now I'm moving in that direction. Otherwise, it's just a good idea. When G, when Peter said to him, "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God," he was saying, "Thou art the Christos." You are the anointed one and the anointing that comes from God. When once Peter realized that about the anointing and the power of the anointing, he said to him, Jesus said back to him, you're no longer Peter, you're, you're a set Petros, you're a chip off the rock. Then he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of God, the keys of the basilea, the dominion of everything God oversees. I'm giving you the keys to it. Whatever you bind, it's, know that it's already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose, the Father's already loosed it in heaven. You're simply responding to what has already taken place in heaven. But he didn't get that until he first of all had understood, thou art the anointing. So you go back to when he said, Paul says, I press towards this one thing, to lay hold on for the very thing that I was laid hold on by the anointed one, I am now laying hold on of the anointing. Yeah. The anointing is not just a feeling, not just an emotion, just chill bumps. Amen. The anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit to kill some stuff of the past and release me to the hope of the future. So the presence of God is a presence pressure that causes old things to pass away if one chooses to do it where I can just live in the fact that well, in the omnipresence, he's around, but I want to live in the reality that he's within. Yeah. We get this out of Acts, excuse me, Isaiah 10, 27. And he says, and the yoke was destroyed and the burden removed because of the anointing. The original reads like this, because of the anointing, the yoke has been removed and the burden destroyed, or rather the, the yoke destroyed and the burden was removed through the anointing. The greater internal inside of us, and the picture is that yoke that they put around slaves, like oxen yoke, put around them. He said what breaks it is the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you becomes so big that the yoke that's trying to constrict you on the outside becomes so immense on the inside, it literally explodes the outside. The greater anointed one inside of you begins to take over and he rules and reigns in such a way that you're not running from the presence of God, but I'm allowing the presence of God to increase and become greater. You have to practice that. How do I do that? It's when the enemy comes in, I'm going to allow the presence of God to become the flood because Yah rides on the flood. The devil doesn't ride on the flood. God rides on the flood. When something comes up, instead of saying, oh, we, we're, here we go again, 
you know, this is a mess, and I don't know what I've done to deserve that. And before you get into that, oh, woe is me thing, you get an oh, wow is God. And you begin to think of his goodness, and you allow the anointing of the Lord to get him so strong, and he's saying, he, I, I will not allow the enemy to put that on me again, and the anointing can, continues to break that. If you're a person that's experienced fear, you can tell when that fear comes back. All of a sudden, it suppresses or it causes you to be angry on the inside. And the Holy Spirit will touch that again, put you in circumstances to bring that up so that you say, I'm not going to go back there again. But if you yield into it, I've got to go around this thing again. Now, 1 John 2 and verse 27. The anointing which you have received from him abides in you. He says in John 15, if my word abides in you and you abide in me, you can ask what you will. The word abide there literally means pitch a tent, dwell, live, it becomes a lifestyle. That's where I live. That's my address. Where do you live? I live in the presence. Sounds like a charismatic somebody saying that. I asked God, how are you doing? Oh, I'm in the will of God. Okay. He said, the anointing that you have doesn't just come and go, it's inside of you. But how come I don't always allow the anointing to take the first step? It's because part of my soul, my nature is, wants to rise up and move out from an old inner vow that says, you're weak. Step back. And all of a sudden, that thing pushes you back down. But when you refuse to allow that thing to rise up and to intimidate or pull you down, then what happens is the anointing that abides in you has now had a greater place and so authority. We're seated with him in heavenly places. That means that we're not only seated with him, but he's seated in us at a higher level. Stand with me, you would, please. I can't tell you how much this last year the Holy Spirit has put me in situations that I was totally uncomfortable. Recently, in a situation with people that are very well known around the country, spiritual leaders, and I'm sitting at the table thinking, why am I here? Way over my head. And the more I thought about that, the more intimidated I became. I felt like you know, the spies that went into the land and the more they looked around saw the giants and then it says, and we became like grasshoppers in, their, in our own sight, not their sight, our own sight. This morning, if you feel like a grasshopper and you've created that picture in your own sight, know that in God. Somewhere an inner vow was taken. Somebody said something. Someone put you in a position that you don't belong in that position. You don't belong in the table. But if God's called you, you have a seat at that table. You may not feel like it. There are certain things that God resists. You need to hear this. He resists the proud. He resists the arrogant. He resists the people that think that they have it all in their own ability to do. But for those saying, I'm weak, hey, I'm attracted to that. When you are weak, he becomes strong. But don't let the weakness be a no answer. Lord, I'm going into this with weakness and I'm trusting somehow or another you're going to kick in in the middle of this and say something and do something that's going to be awesome. Bottom line, the presence of God is wonderful. It's sweet. It's gracious. But at the same time, he loves us so much, the presence of God can be on us so pressure that he presses us towards where we need to be. I can resist to eventually I become hardened in heart and eventually the presence is removed though his omnipresence is still there. You can gather a crowd with gifting. Some of you need to hear this today. You can gather a crowd by your gifting but it's only through the anointing that the yoke's broken. And we've got a lot of ministry around the world now that's very gifted. They can wow a crowd, they can gather people around, telling stories, telling things that are interesting. But it's only the anointing that says it breaks the yoke, not the gifting. 
So when you go after gifting, go after the very personal intimacy with Jesus, the anointed one. Because a gift without the anointing just becomes a hollow information that doesn't cause any transformation. So Father, I pray over all of us standing here today. Let the refreshing of your presence, O God, set upon us in such a mighty way. That your anointing, O God, breaks the yoke in people's lives. Even breaks the mindset of how we view ourselves. Whether it's arrogant, prideful, or just intimidated. So I pray over every person in this room today, God, that right now there is the anointed one rising up inside of us to destroy the, the yoke and remove the burden of carrying something you never said we had to carry. Removing the burden from a days gone by, removing the burden of blaming yourself instead of allowing Jesus to come along and said, let me get under this thing with you. I know how to feed 5,000, have you? Then let me take the lead. And the Holy Spirit just wants to just begin to cleanse people that are in, that your life is revolving around criticism. I had someone tell me, well, this is the way God made me. No, God didn't make you that way. That's maybe how you grew up in. Because you feel empowered when you're criticizing other people, or criticizing the system, or criticizing something. So you feel empowered because you're showing that you're more than they are. And I'm telling you, by the Spirit of the Lord, He wants to sever that, that it's not part of your nature. He gives wisdom, but He doesn't give criticism to put somebody else down. So, Father, we just bless this house. May the purpose and the presence of the Lord extend in a greater dominion in every way in every way. Now I'm going to make one step further this morning. I'm purposely preaching less. You know, it's 12, 15. I'm purposely, because I know sometimes there's just so much on us trying to information, but I want us to have this ministry time. If there is something that you know this morning as I was teaching along, the Holy Spirit quickened you that he wants to sever or break a yoke, I want you to step forward, just come forward. We'll pray with you. We'll believe for that. The idea that you step forward begins to say, I don't want to live with this anymore. It could be a physical thing. It could be a mental thing. It could just simply be a, an enemy torturing, tormenting. It takes courage to say, I'm, I, want to get, I want to get free. I want to get free. Because everything we read in the Scripture talks about the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus declared in Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to do what? He's anointed me. Do what? To heal the brokenhearted. The broken heart just doesn't mean I'm grieved because there's a loss in my life. The broken heart means my heart's broke. I have lost hope. My heart no longer can see the land of the living. And the land of the living speaks of, of all that God has given us to live life out. You're standing here, I want you to just lift your hands. We're going to pray. <laughs> Father, I agree with every person standing here today that the power of Jesus Christ, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is severing ties with an old thing, an old response, an old reaction that I can let go of the plow behind and grab hold with both hands and not look back and say the Lord has severed ties with that old thing. No matter what happened, no matter that experience that took place when a young, as a young person, no matter how it made you feel, the Holy Spirit right now can sever ties with the old, but He also can come and bring healing for the days ahead and heal you so that you'll no longer go back there the fear of going back to that old place. And I speak over every person right now in the name of Jesus. We break up with the devil. We break up with thoughts. We break up with intents. We break up with conversations that takes us back to those days of what if and how come and you always and you never. The blame game. We break up with those old tapes. We break up with those conversations in our head. 
and will not allow the enemy to afflict and torment us anymore. But we press towards that anointing. We press towards the anointed one. Let your focus and your attention become on the presence, Lord, on a daily basis. You wake up in the morning. Good morning, Holy Spirit. I'm here. Good morning, Lord. What do you want us to do? I want to be aware of you at every moment in time. So I speak over every person. I want someone to just walk around and lay hands on people here. I want to have a divine contact with them. <coughs> Jesus, you're the healer. There's an anointing to heal what has been broken. There's anointing to cut loose from being tied to something of an old nature. Where the enemy tries to remind you of failure and fault, Jesus comes to remind you of his greatness and his goodness and his might and his power. May the Lord bless you. May his countenance comes upon you and he washes out those things that he didn't plant and he didn't establish there. By the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I call you into a place of anointing right now. I call you into that place. Jesus, rise up. Jesus, rise up. Jesus, rise up. <coughs> Jesus, rise up. By the authority and power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, rise up and remove all of the, all of the yoke. Right now, right now, right now. Establish Jesus. Establish a vow inside of me. I mean, there's good vows and bad vows. Just say, I choose to set my heart upon the Lord. I'll not enter into arguments and vain and foolish questions that Paul talks about that create strife and take me out of your rest. I'm not going to enter into debates and things God you didn't call me into. It's only going to be the good fight, the fight of faith that I can win. And see the salvation of the Lord. If you're dealing with any health issues, whether you may be in the audience right now, part of the yoke the enemy wants to put on us is affliction. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but, but, God delivers them out of them all, out of them all. So, Father, we thank you that Jesus came and the bread was broken, the bread that came down from above and the bread that was broken that you gave to us. And you said healing is the children's bread. So I release the covenant right to every child of God to receive the life-giving message that by your stripes we're healed and fulfilled in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. All of you that are standing in the audience, just lay hands on yourself. Lord, we receive the impartation of the anointed one the resurrection just wasn't for us to go to heaven. The resurrection was so that we would be empowered to break all of the rights that the enemy had on our life. All of the rights to our family, all the rights to steal, kill, and destroy. And with the power of resurrection today, you sever those ties and release your presence upon us. And we thank you for it, your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. While there's people still being ministered here at the front, if you need to go, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, and may the Lord give you peace. Have a wonderful week. See you next week. Bye-bye.